This video is sponsored by Dubby Jitterless Energy Blend. Click on the link in the description and use the code PACKERMAN to save 10% on any order. Well, we just had the clash at the Coliseum and there's a lot of tempers coming out of this one. And there's a lot to talk about, so let's get into it. This is The Fuel. What's happening, ladies and germs? This is the Packer Man, and welcome to this edition of The Fuel under the new uh, format that I'm going to be using for this show going forward. Instead of the podcast style format, it's going to be a short form format where there's going to be some new stories thrown in and some wacky editing on top of that, and basically a short form review. So let's get into it. So, NASCAR and the race teams are locked in a little bit of a dispute right now. NASCAR is nearing a new media rights deal, but there is a simmering dispute with teams over revenue, and it has complicated matters quite a bit. According to Adam Stern on Twitter, starting in 2025, teams are asking NASCAR for about 16 to 18 million dollars in league revenue that could be earned per car per year for top performers, which is roughly double the current amount, and they also want to make the charter system permanent, so obviously they like how the charter system is going as well. Uh, this could definitely cause some issues and some butting of heads between the organizations and the team, so it'll be interesting to see what's going to happen once the uh, rights deal comes up. Also, there were quite a few new rules changes for the 2023 season. First of all, no cautions for stage breaks at NASCAR Cup Series road course events. The points will be awarded as usual, but the races will be allowed to continue without any stage cautions, which means that the road course races have been returned to us in their full glory. Which means that we're going to get to see strategy races and all that stuff again. So yay for positive change. Other things that have been changed. Detached wheel penalty has been changed. It's The penalties has been kind of switched around a little bit and also reduced in certain cases. Uh, if the wheel has been lost on pit road, driver has to serve a pass through penalty under green flag conditions or restart at the rear of the field under yellow flag conditions. If lost on track, a two-lap penalty and a two-race suspension for two pit crew members will be issued. So obviously this is quite the bit of a change from the four-race suspension, of regardless of how the wheel comes off, that we had last year. So this is, I think, a positive change. Also, there will be wet tires available for damp conditions at select ovals, which were the Los Angeles Memorial Coliseum, Martinsville, North Wilkesboro, New Hampshire, Phoenix, Richmond, Milwaukee, and Indianapolis Raceway Park. And finally, points requirement for playoff eligibility has been removed. Previously, it was the top 20 for the Xfinity and Truck Series and the top 30 for the NASCAR Cup Series. So that has been completely removed. As long as you make all the races, if you manage to get a win and finish in the top 16 of those who win, then you're locked into the playoffs. I don't know how that's going to work out, but we'll have to wait and see. Also, the choose rule. That's also been changed. Previously, the choose rule was not, a fellow, was not available for the super speedway races and the dirt race. That has been changed. Now, all of the races will have the choose rule, including super speedways and the dirt race. Well, that's certainly going to shake things up, especially at the super speedway races, because when you have a situation where you can't choose your partner a lot of times because of how they line up, now you will be able to choose who you want to get behind the draft. So that's going to make the super speedway restarts a lot more interesting. Another notable rule that NASCAR made during this off season was the fact that they have banished uh, wall riding. So the hail melon is no longer allowed. And if it does happen, then drivers who do it will be assessed a time penalty. So as a result of this, Trackhouse Racing has decided to preserve Ross Chastain's car from that Martinsville race. I think, it was, I think it's a pretty cool deal considering the fact that, you know, it was one of them moments of all time that you certainly won't forget if you watched it live like I did. So, let's get into the race itself. This is your review of the 2023 Bush Light Clash at the Coliseum, at the LA Memorial Coliseum. So, here is how the format worked for this year's Clash at the Coliseum. On February the 4th, there was single car qualifying to determine a uh, starting order for the four scheduled heat races. And then we had the heat races on the fifth, where the fastest qualifier would get the pole for heat one, second fastest qualifier would get the pole for heat two, third fastest qualifier, pole for heat three, and fourth fastest qualifier gets the pole for heat four. 
top five from each race advance through to the clash based on where they finish. And each heat race was 25 laps. And then there was LCQ races where the top three from those 50 lap races would advance to the clash. With the 27th and final spot reserved for the driver who finished the highest in the 2022 season point standings who did not transfer based on finishing position. So 27 different cars started this race. So what happened in the heats? Well, Eric Alvarola managed to win heat number one, and Martin Truex Jr. won heat number two, though the focus was on the big battle for the transfer spot, which saw Ricky Stenhouse Jr. get into Chase Elliott, and Kevin Harvick sneak by both of them to get the fifth and final transfer spot for heat two, which was a good start for him to this season, considering the fact that he is going to be retiring at the conclusion of the 2023 season, after 23 seasons in the sport. I mean, there's really not much else for him to accomplish considering that he's won the Daytona 500, the Coke 600. Uh, he's his former champion. I mean, there isn't really much else that he can do, and he's certainly getting up there in age. I mean, he's going to be pushing uh, close to 50 here before too long. So, And he also said that he was going to be moving into the Fox broadcast booth in 2024. So that'll be pretty interesting. Denny Hamlin would win heat number three with William Byron getting the win in heat number four. So we move into the LCQs where Micah McDowell gets a surprising win in LCQ number one and Chase Elliott would take the win in LCQ number two in a photo finish with Ty Gibbs, which was a pretty good race. And Christopher Bell would make it into the race based on points. So now we get to the main event itself, 150 laps where only green flag laps count. So, how did I feel about this race? Well, I mean, it was kind of eh. When the action was going, the racing was actually pretty good. The problem is, there were just way too many cautions during this race. And there were times where it felt like this race would just drag and drag. When there were cautions like rapid fire, especially in the second half of the race... That's when this race started to lose me. It's like, oh my God, can we please get this race going? I think there was somebody that said there was a stat where they only completed five green flag laps in 35 minutes. I'm sorry, I don't find that kind of racing very entertaining. When there's caution after caution after caution after caution, it's just like, oh my God, this race is starting to turn into a mess. And I'm just not a fan of that kind of racing. I know it's short track racing, but I mean, that's not really much of an excuse when you consider the fact that last year's race saw only five caution flags and we had a run to the end of like 60 laps. No excuse. None whatsoever. So while this race was definitely entertaining while it was green, the large number of cautions where it was just caution after caution after caution after caution after caution it got really old after a while I'm not gonna lie so while this race had its high points it could have been better a lot better now obviously if you were there live like uh, call me Kyle was from spare parts was I mean he found the race to be very entertaining and you know what that's great but I could only critique what I'm shown you know and that's another thing Fox Sports coverage just absolutely sucks I don't know what the hell has gone on down there the past couple years, but their coverage just absolutely sucks, it seems like. It has gone really downhill. Cameras missing key points. I mean, there was a Truex, I think, at one point making a move for second, and they just didn't even show it. They had the, they were focused on uh, basically a non-battle, and you could hear the the play-by-play uh, -play announcer saying, hey, there's a pass for second going on, and they just flat out, forget to point it at the second place battle. So really kind of irritating in that sense. One of the notable instances of severe beef during this race was Kevin Harvick and Todd Gilliland. Gilliland actually spun Harvick out on lap 78 and then several laps later, Harvick returned the favor and sent Gilliland off the front of his bumper. Not exactly the best start for Todd Gilliland and it got even worse afterwards when literally a week and a half away from the Daytona 500, he gets informed by Front Row Motorsports that he's not going to be running the whole season. He's only going to be running 30 races. And Zane Smith, who won the truck title last year for Front Row Motorsports, 
is going to be driving for several races in the 38 car. This obviously came as a shock to Todd Gilliland, who let everybody know what was going on on Twitter. So, in order to maintain his eligibility for the playoff, he's going to have to find a way to find another team to fill in those last six races. Otherwise, he will not be playoff eligible. Pretty crappy situation that Front Row Motorsports put Todd Gilliland in, especially you know, considering that he's a second-year driver. Not exactly the best way to build his confidence for the future. And not exactly the best way to build his confidence and also his desire to want to stay with your team. Pretty shitty way to treat your second-year driver, in my opinion. But without a doubt, my driver of the day was Ryan Priest. He had been assigned to drive the 41 car for 2023, which in turn drops Cole Custer back down into the Xfinity Series. So I was curious to see what would happen if you get, they got Ryan Priest behind the wheel of that 41 car and see what he could do with it. Turns out, a lot. He led the most laps of the race at 44, but unfortunately, electrical problems would cause him to drop back to the field, and I believe he finished 7th overall. Still, that was a far better drive that, he, that he's been given that 41 car than we've seen in years. Not Probably not since Kurt Busch have we seen the 41 car look that good. So, I have a funny feeling that Ryan Priest is going to give that car a really good ride in 2023 and make Cole Custer look really, really bad. But by far, the man who had the best comeback drive of the day was Kyle Busch who got spun by Joey Logano late in the race, but somehow managed to make his way from 25th all the way back up to 3rd at the finish. Certainly a good run, and it would certainly help to take his mind off the fact that he got detained at the airport in Mexico while he had a handgun in his bag. Yeah, seriously. According to a statement that Kyle Busch posted on his Twitter, in late January, Samantha and I enjoyed a several-day vacation in Mexico, when departing the country, my handgun was flagged during routine screening at the airport. I have a valid concealed carry permit from my local authority and adhere to all handgun laws, but I made a mistake by forgetting it was in my bag. Discovery of the handgun led to my detainment. While the situation was resolved, I was not aware of Mexican law and had no intention of bringing a handgun into Mexico. When it was discovered, I fully cooperated with the authorities, accepted the penalties, and returned to North Carolina. I apologize for my mistake and appreciate the respect shown by all parties as we resolve the matter. My family and I consider this issue closed. Also, a lot of people are saying, well, wouldn't he get in trouble with NASCAR for that? He made NASCAR aware of what was going on, and he also made it clear that he was just detained, not arrested. Which is kind of weird considering the fact that there were newspaper articles in Mexico saying that he had been arrested and was already sentenced to three and a half years in jail. How can you be sentenced for something that you weren't arrested for? That just makes no sense. I don't know. It, it's a weird situation, but it definitely seems like an honest mistake. I mean, the gun is registered. I mean, he had all the, you know, carry conceal licenses that he needed and all that stuff. He just simply forgot that it was in his bag. I mean, shit happens. What else can you do? I mean, it, it seemed like it was an honest mistake. I mean, he has no reason to take a gun to Mexico. I mean, if he was just there on vacation. You know what I mean? So, I think I consider this an odd matter. It is what it is. Let's move on. So, after 150 laps of chaos, it would turn out to be Martin Trix Jr., who would take the checkered flag and score his first ever victory in the Bush-like clash. Which is certainly good news for him, because he let people know on his Instagram that... He and his longtime girlfriend, Sherry Pollux, actually broke up, which was really kind of surprising. To my fans and partners, Sherry and I have made the decision to end our relationship. I will continue supporting Sherry moving forward. I would ask that you respect our privacy, as there will be no further comment about this matter. Definitely one of the more shocking stories to come out over the past month, considering how long of a relationship that they had, damn near two decades. So, it was definitely a bit shocking that when this story broke oh, a couple weeks ago. So, all I can say is, you know, prayers to them and best of luck to them in uh, whatever they decide to do from this point forward. Also, after this race was over, I have another little nitpick as far as Fox Sports is concerned. They were hyping up the fact that they were doing gold, silver, and bronze medals for this edition of The Clash, considering that 
It was at the LA Memorial Coliseum where I think three separate Olympics have been held. So they were just doing this whole big thing where they were hyping up, you know, the medal ceremony where the top three was Martin Tricks Jr. Austin Dillon ended up finishing second, which is good. I mean, last two years he's finished third and second. And then Kyle Busch finished third. But right after uh, Kyle Busch was awarded his bronze medal, they ended the, the broadcast right there. I mean, why the hell are you going to hype all that up just to end the broadcast before they even award the medals? Like, what's, what kind of nonsense is that? Like, what the hell is that? I mean, just another brain-dead example of Fox Sports, you know, shooting themselves in their own foot. It's absolutely ridiculous, and honestly, when the rights deals come up, I honestly hope that somebody else takes the reins because I know Fox has been around for this will be their 23rd year but it's time for a change they obviously don't give a shit about the product anymore even though they have been getting great ratings the past few years I mean the ratings have been going back up I don't know why Fox doesn't really give a crap about NASCAR at this point but it's honestly showed in their broadcasts it's like they don't give a shit about it anymore and that's honestly a shame maybe it's time for somebody else to take the reins because some of these broadcasts are just cringe to watch at this point. I mean, I honestly would rather watch NBC do the broadcasts at this point. That's just my feeling. That's just my feeling on it. So, your top 10 finishers from the Bushlight Clash at the Coliseum. Truex with the win led the final 25 laps. Austin Dillon came home in second. Kyle Busch got drop kicked back to the back of the field by Joey Logano because Joey Logano is just a douche like that. But Kyle Busch was able to run his way all the way back up to third. And honestly, that, I think that was the most entertaining part of the whole thing was watching Kyle Busch come all the way back to the field. Alex Bowman with a good run, coming home in fourth. Kyle Larson in fifth. Tyler Reddick in his new ride in the 45, coming home in sixth. Ryan Priest, who led the most laps, 43 laps, comes home in seventh with Ross Chastain in eighth. Denny Hamlin in ninth and William Byron rounding out the top ten. Some of the stats from this race, there were only four lead changes during the race. One of those was a pure lead change, and there were 15 total caution flags from this race. Final thoughts from this race? It was alright. It could have been a lot better. I honestly thought last year's race was better. Too many caution flags, I think, really killed it for me. But when they were racing, the racing was actually really good. And there had been some talks about this race becoming a points race because of the Auto Club Speedway not being on the schedule next year because they're doing their conversion. Nah, I don't think we need this to be a points race. I mean, they already kind of made it convoluted by adding more cars, which in turn led to more caution flags. So making this a points race? No, it doesn't need to be a points race. We need to keep it an exhibition race. Let it have that unique feel to it and let's find a different track to replace Auto Club with. There are rumors going around that Rockingham Speedway might be in the running to get back on the cup schedule. Ooh, that would be pretty exciting. But we'll have to wait and see on that. But as far as my feelings of this race, it was alright. It could have been a lot better though. Way too many caution flags. Um, just watch, way too much nonsense in my opinion. But, you know, it is what it is. See, let's uh, get ready for the Daytona 500 coming up in about a week and a half. My final rating for the Bush Light Clash at the Coliseum is a 5 out of 10. What's happening ladies and germs? Thank you for watching tonight's video. If you're interested in sponsoring the channel, there is a link to my Patreon down in the description box below. Otherwise, hit like and subscribe if you want to continue watching great content like you saw today. Thank you very much for watching, and until next time, this is the Packer Man. Signing out.